Hello, hello there, fellow quilters. I'm so glad you're joining in today. I'm Susan Smith. We are in my studio, Stitched by Susan. And today I'm quilting a very special project. We are expecting a brand new grandson in just a couple of weeks time. And super excited about that. And of course I have to make him a quilt. So today I am quilting on that. This is a live and unscripted episode. So if you're new to my channel, generally on these episodes, you're just coming into my studio. It is live. It's in real time and kind of looking over my shoulder while I do a project and whatever things are specific to that project, sometimes challenges, sometimes just points of interest. I'll kind of talk my way through as I do it. So it's not really a class. I'm not really teaching. I'm just kind of talking my way through the things I'm doing, the decisions I'm making. And of course, you're free to ask questions in the comments. So a couple of things before we get going, um, feel free to chime in where you're watching from, maybe what you're doing today. Um, if you're, especially if you're quilting or sewing while I'm doing this, and I frankly encourage you to do that, to turn on these episodes while you're doing things around your house, baking bread, doing laundry or sewing, whatever the thing is. I know they're longish episodes, so it's handy to just have them going in the background and just be kind of listening in and your ears perk up whenever you hear something of interest. So I'm great with that. Um, a few things. Make sure to note on your calendar today, obviously, I'm sewing on a Friday and that's going to be our new live and unscripted time going forward. Our family schedule has shifted a bit, so it will now be the first and third Friday of every month. Now, happily for you, the month of October has a fifth Friday. So I'm about 90% sure that I'll be offering a little bonus live episode on the 29th of this month. So it probably will not be a quilting project. It will be me on screen. Um, a few of you have been chiming in on topics you'd like to hear more of. Maybe some drawn um, quilting illustrations. Not 100% sure yet what that'll be, but there'll be a little bonus episode on October 29. If you're not already signed up for my newsletter, I encourage you to do that. You can find a sign up form on my website, stitchedbysusan.com. And I always send out a newsletter before these live and unscripted to kind of let you know what the topic is or in the case of bonus episodes, um, you know, whether they're happening and when. So uh, let's see what else. Want to make sure that you are catching on to my podcast, which comes out weekly every Wednesday morning. This past week, Georgia Stull of Heartland Quilting joined me. Now she uses um, digital computerized quilting. And so it was just fascinating to hear her point of view because it's quite a different quilting experience from mine. But she's been in business for a lot of years and she is a wonderful, warm lady and just really encouraging to listen to. So all the past episodes can be found at podcast.stitchedbysusan.com. And they're all interview based. So I'm looking for quilters that have stories. And if one of you is interested, please don't let the fact that you maybe don't have a business or don't have a massive story stop you. I'm looking also for just personal, interesting stories, opportunities that quilting has provided for you, or maybe tough seasons of life that it's carried you through. So if you have a story, quilting or either of, of even other crafts, or if you know someone who has a story, I'd love to hear about it. But that's just about enough talking, isn't it? Let's get on to today's project. Uh, well, first, let's say hello. Sorry. Let's say hello before we get going. Who's chiming in? I'm, I'm waiting for, for Mr. Producer to get stuff on the screen. So you're seeing me just standing here looking at it. <laughs> I can read Eileen's name, but I can't read I the know. comment from here. I've got a little comment this big on the screen. Dave's working on that. Bear with us. <laughs> if it takes very long, I'll go on to another topic. Here we go. Eileen. Good morning from North Ogden, Utah on this chilly morning. Chilly here too, but by the way, chilly or no, I'm still quilting in my bare feet, if anyone's wondering. Mickey, hi from the North Georgia Mountains, laying out a quilt to peace today. Excellent. Barbara, good morning from Minnesota. Sunny but getting chilly, putting binding on a baby quilt this morning. How fun is it that we get to sew together? Arlene from Spokane Valley, Washington, practically my neighbor. Christine, good morning. Iowa is sunny, breezy, and low 50s. That's not too bad. Jill from Minnesota, just finished cutting the grass and my reward for a job well done is to sit and chill for a while with Susan and Dave. Oh, I'm so happy we could be that reward for you. <laughs> Thanks for joining in. Mona, piecing a double wedding ring. Wow. 
I hope you will post pictures and I'd love to be tagged in it just so that I see the pictures when you post them. Washington State. Great. Diana from Texas. Now this is the one from Northern Sioux. And Northern Sioux. Good morning from Bancroft, Ontario. Raking leaves today. They smell so wonderful. But when I look at them, I think of all those colors in a quilt. Hmm. Well, I look forward to seeing what you do with that, Sue. <laughs> Northern Sioux Quilting, is this a brother for the sweetheart you went to visit? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. She gets to be a big sister. And Paula, good morning from Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Roll Tide. Not sure where you're going with that one. Let me know. Let me know if it was a typo or if I'm just missing a joke you're trying to share. <laughs> okay, so here we go. Today's particular topic is going to be a little bit less about the quilting and more about this minky backing that I'm using. Minky, it's funny, I'm in a lot of, you know, Facebook groups where people are sharing pictures and problems and answers and experience. And people are very polarized about minky. Some are like, yeah, love it, use it all the time. And others are like, whoop, never again, hate that stuff. So I'm just going to give you, as always, my viewpoints on it. They're not the way to do it, but it's what works for me. So I've got my backing laid out. Uh, Mr. Producer, can I see a picture so I can see what's showing up? And they are, yes, there you go. Now you can see it. It's not as flat as it could be laying here on the long arm because, as you know, Minky is kind of heavy and it's wanting to pull off. But what I wanted to show you is... The minky is 58 inches wide and my quilt is 56. So that's not really enough wiggle room for using my leaders and having any space to spare. So I attach this leader and all it is is a scrappy piece of fabric. It's actually the leftover trimmings from a quilt from earlier days. And I've just basted it along this edge. But here's the important thing. I know I say this so often when quilting with challenges. It's cumulative, so all the way along at all the steps, you need to be proactive about managing this stuff. So here's the first step with my minky, is I wanted to make sure I did not stretch my minky at all when I was sewing on this leader, right? So I actually laid the minky out flat on the floor and smoothed it, and then laid my piece on top and smoothed it, and then put a few pins in so that I had checkpoints so that I was sure to not be either stretching or pulling in that minky so it lays as flat as possible. And I'll tell you honestly, I look at it when I lay it flat along my arm here and it still is not, I've got rumples underneath it so we really can't see. It still is not perfectly smooth. I think I got a little bit more cotton than minky for length. So I'm going to make sure in my next step, which is loading, that I do not stretch this cotton additionally. I'm going to make it a little effort to pull it in a bit. Does that make sense? So at every step, I'm trying to be aware and head off the problems at the pass. Um, there is no need to press that seam. It's going to get entirely trimmed off at the end. We're not going to have to sew over it at all on the long arm. So let's get on with our loading process. I think I'll go the other way though. Bear with me while I change this. And by the way, if you have friends you know of who work with Minky or have problems with it or would like to work with it, I encourage you to share this episode. I think it will be helpful. By and large, my loading method will be the same. Um, just going to start with my straight leader edge on the side facing me. And I've added about three and a half inches of leeway by using this leader. Funny story. I was in a craft store yesterday purchasing the minky. And I said to the lady behind the counter, I need, I think I said to her 62 inches, if I recall correctly. And so she kind of did the math in her head. You know, a yard is 36. And then she added so many more. Well, I stood there. Fortunately, she said it out loud and then she cut and I stood there thinking through that math. And then I was like, no, no, that's only 59 inches actually that you gave me. So bless her heart. She was very sweet. She actually recut it for me because then I would have been short in the other direction too, if that makes sense. 
and I don't know that I said, but I will point it out now. I've got the selvage of the minky on this edge and on the far end. There's a little bit of difference in the stretchability of it. And so I like to load the selvage on purpose on my leaders. So if you want more details about loading a quilt, there are other episodes that I go into that in more depth and talk about it more for today. I'm just trying to get it on Lucy the long arm. And again, I'm just being proactive with every step. I'm trying to watch that I have neither stretched nor scrunched up the minky. And I just judge that based on how smoothly this is laying. And of course, we're seeing all these dots and things. So I'm gauging, are the sides running straight? Are there any wrinkles, you know, pulling to one side or the other? It's just a visual guide to see that it is in fact loading up straight and being neither stretched nor pulled in. I'm just looking at this front edge. It's kind of, it's hard to judge because it wants to pull in a bit like ribbing because of the dots and because of the knit quality. So this looks a little bit wider to me, but I don't think it actually is. It's so small. And when I put just a little tension on the sides, it comes out perfectly straight. So I think we're golden. I'm going to go ahead and roll it up. And I'm going slowly because Minky is heavy. And if you go quickly, the weight of it is apt to, apt to just swoop right over your top leader. And then you have to back up and kind of start again. So here again, what view are you seeing? It's not very clear in the camera, but there, can you see there's a bit of fullness? hanging in areas here. So I'm just going to smooth it out toward the edges a bit until I feel like that lays flatter. Mr. Producer is just messing with the cameras. Again, it's tricky because the salvage edge always appears a little bit ruffled. So I don't want to stretch it out to that extent, but I want to make sure that the, it's not being pulled in by the dots and the knit quality. That looks pretty smooth to me. That looks pretty darn good. It's wanting to pull just a little bit because it's so heavy. So I'm just kind of being cautious of that, pulling it back into where I want it to be. And you can see how the extra three inches or so of my cotton leader is really going to make all the difference. It's just too hard with this sort of stretchy selvage on Minky to be working too, too close to the wire. I need that little bit of excess so that I can make sure it's flat and not be dealing with the stretched salvage right under my leaders. Okay, we've got it on. Good deal. There's our minky. I'm happy with that. That looks nice and smooth. Now you can probably see, yep, yeah, it's on this end, that end too a little. You're seeing a little bit of droop. I leave my minky a little looser than I leave other fabrics, like cotton fabrics, because you do not want to be stretching it out. Maybe you want to put the camera on me again for a moment, Dave. Because it is knitted, it's really easy to overstretch and you don't want to do that. What happens if you overstretch it is when you release it from the long arm, the minky will pull back together and your whole quilt will want to curve in on itself towards the back. That's how you'll know you've overstretched your minky. So, I mean, that comes a little bit with experience. I just know I need to leave this looser than I would if it was a cotton. So I'm only going to put enough tension on it that it pulls out smooth. I'm not going to stretch it at all. So let's get our batting on. Yeah, 
while I lay this on, Dave's going to pop up a question about the backing. And this, by the way, is Hobbs 8020, my very favorite um, batting. Okay, Northern Sue is asking, I'm puzzled because on the camera it looks skewed. It, it isn't. So I'm sorry that it looks that way. It must just have a little to do with our camera angle. My sides are straight. It's even this way in terms of tension. There we go. And the truth of the matter is, there's a little bit of give in all fabric, right? So it's, it's not, you know, if you've got an eighth or a quarter of an inch, that's not a big deal at all. What you don't want is two and three inches of disparity or stretch or unevenness. Now I am going to move this quilt fairly close up to my leader. And I might have to rewind so you guys can see that well. The camera seems really high up today, Dave. Is that so? We may try and shift the camera because you're not really able to see what I'm doing. Again, because I know that I don't have a lot of excess to work with, I'm putting my quilt quite close up to the top. And I'm actually going to roll the whole thing back toward me so I don't have to be working fully at arm's length. There we go. So another gauge for me, which you all aren't able to see well, is I can look at my roller that's down on the side that my backing is rolled onto, and it's nice and straight on there. So that also is a good gauge for me. If it was running off to one side or the other, that would show up there. So you aren't able to see that on camera, but I can see it here. So that's helpful. Okay. Once more, I'm just shifting this up a little. And I'm going to pop a few pins in it because the minky, the wrong side of it, is a bit slippery. So the quilt can shift quite easily. So I'm going to use my visual guide of my seam that's running along the front of this bar to make sure that it's straight. And I'm just going to pop in a very few pins to make sure that as a whole it can't shift. I may end up shifting it a little bit as I stitch across the top edge, but this just keeps the whole thing as a whole in place. Um, I should mention too, there are quite a few bias edges in this quilt. So for example, every one of these triangles on this top edge is bias. And let me see, going down the sides, they're not. So that's handy. And I didn't specifically think of that before I loaded this, but now that I've seen it, I'm very happy I've thought of it and that I've loaded it this way. Can you see me again? There you go. Much easier to deal with that bias edge on the top and on the bottom than on the sides. So not impossible on the sides at all. Um, last Live and Unscripted, you watched me do a wonky quilt and deal with that. But I find it easier if there's a... a edge that needs attention, it's easier to have it top and bottom than side to side. Just my personal opinion. All right. And you know what, ladies? This is a great time for comments because I just realized we were fiddling with cameras and things this morning and I actually never loaded my proper thread. I see it sitting, ready to load. So I'm going to load thread. Feel free to chime in any comments. It's going to take me a minute to get my thread, but I'll get back to the comment when I get back around the machine. So bear with me a second while I do that. Okay. In the meantime, those of you who are piecing your quilts and laying out your quilts, you can just keep on. This will just take a moment.
before I load it, I'll actually come talk to you guys for just a second about thread. Um, I feel like that's a dark one. I know I've talked about my thread theory a couple times before, but it never hurts to talk about it again. Let's just bring a couple shades. I think these two will do. I think overhead would be ideal. I know it's very difficult to judge colors on camera, but all these neutrals, there are a variety of them. I think I have six different ones in the quilt and they're all gray tones. They look very creamy in the photograph, but of course every monitor will be different too. But in real life, they all have gray tones. So in choosing what thread I want to quilt with, first off, I know that I'm doing an edge to edge design. And so my head is cut off, dear. Which way shall I be standing? That works pretty good. Um, I know that I'm quilting an edge to edge design. So whatever thread I use is going to hit all the fabrics pretty much equally, right? So you're seeing the kind of darker end of the quilt at the top here. It's got some navy, it's got some teal, it's got even some deep plum going on. Going further down in the quilt, there's a bit brighter colors, some oranges, some golden yellows, um, a couple of grays. So what can I do that's going to blend reasonably well with all the fabrics? And because I do edge to edge all the time, this is my personal color theory, is that I want to do something kind of middle of the road. So if I were to choose the lightest color in the quilt, which would be a very pale silvery gray, that would be so stark on the navy pieces or the teal pieces. And I don't think I would like that high contrast there because then it would disappear in the very light colored bits. Conversely, if I used a dark thread, like say a teal, because my backing is teal, well, that will show up really beautifully on the backing. It will show up nicely on the teal pieces, but it will be really stark on the gray bits. So what I'm gonna do is go middle of the road and I'm going to use a mid gray that honestly, there's not very much of in the quilt at all. I think there's two gray colors within my scrappy look. So there's not very much of the actual gray color but I feel like it will blend the best with all the things. So I looked at a silvery gray and I looked at a mid gray and it's the mid that I'm going to go with. And I am going to put a teal in my bobbin on the bottom because it's a similar saturation of color to this gray. And I think that will work well on the bottom. I often do exactly the same thread top and bottom, but I think these two will work well together. Okay, so let's get it set up. And I'm really sorry I didn't have that done in advance. There's so many things to think of and we even do have a checklist in the studio, but even so. I don't know that I've ever talked about changing the thread on my machine, but I trust most of you know this trick already, which is back near your spool, you just cut the outgoing thread and not on the incoming thread and then on the front side, unthread the needle and you can just pull that new thread through all the various gauges and dials until it comes out by your needle, cut off the knot and rethread the needle. So I very seldom rethread my whole machine. And I'll give you one little tip for that one. Whenever I'm going to go change thread, I take a second to just pull the thread out of the needle in the front. And the reason I do that is because I have more times than I care to admit forgotten to pull the knot through because when I'm standing at the front of my machine, it looks ready to go. So I'll get distracted putting my side, you know, clamps on or something, and then I'll just start sewing. And then the knot hits the needle and then the thread breaks and everything goes flying and oh my goodness. So that's my tip for today. When you're going to go change thread, just yank it out of the needle so you can't inadvertently start sewing with the wrong one. Okay, we are going to start with our basting. Oh yeah, we do have some questions coming in. Let me just pull up my thread here and then let's talk comments. And I will get a sip of my coffee. I don't think I mentioned earlier, if you are interested in supporting these episodes, they are free, but I do have a little support uh, program and it's at buymeacoffee.com slash forward slash stitched by Susan. And you can make a one-time contribution or there is a membership option available there too. And I have some patterns as a gift for you if you choose that annual membership. That just helps us, um, and you guys have been generous in your support, but it helps us when we need to upgrade cameras, cables, 
monitors. My one monitor that I see your comments on is going, going, going. The color of it is very poor and sometimes hard to read. So over time, we have to replace these things and upgrade them. And hopefully we keep producing a better and better show for you. So buymeacoffee.com forward slash stitched by Susan. Okay, comments. Joey, better late than never. Of course it is. That's always been true. Northern Sue, is your basting stitch going to be longer or shorter when working with Minky or does it matter? To me personally, it doesn't matter. I don't really ever change my stitch size. I just baste it with the same, the same size. Jana, good morning from Suncrest, Washington. Jana's another neighbor. Joey, have you chosen thread yet? Always put blame on the director. <laughs> That's so funny. Thanks for that tip though. Appreciate that, but shh, don't tell him. Arlene, have you had issues with minky or cuddle backing bearding? I don't think that's a problem I've had, Arlene. I do have a fresh needle on my machine. That's kind of my go-to for any bearding problems is fresh needle. And so often when I'll sew with a batik or with a minky, I'll just put a fresh needle on as a matter of course. Barbara, I'm using my red eye treadle to put the binding on, then we'll hand stitch on the back. Nice. What a nice job to be doing on a fall day. Denise, I don't quilt my piece tops, but watching you and all that you do to prepare for quilting makes me appreciate my long arm quilter a whole bunch. Thank you. Hey, I'm glad to help. I'm glad to help. I know sometimes it's hard to know, you know, sort of what it's like in someone else's studio and what challenges they see in your work. That's it. All right, one last sip and we're up, up and away. Got my needle in. Gonna put my channel lock on. Vertical channel lock. And here's where I'm shifting my pins. I've got, I have a vertical channel lock on my machine, which is just a magnetic lock so that I'm making a perfectly straight vertical line. So I'm literally adjusting my quilt to match my stitching line, if that makes sense. It really helps to keep things square. And I will do the same thing across the top. If you have that feature, it's really nice to be able to just focus on keeping the fabric flat and smooth and not have to focus on making the straight line. If your machine does not have a built-in one, I've heard people say that they can use just an office pincher clip on the rail of their machine to hold it you know from being able to wobble up and down so that's a good little hack if you don't happen to have this channel lock it's one of the features I love about gamel machines even the most basic machines have the channel lock and I use it all the time so you can see how I'm just putting a little pressure with my left hand on the area that's already been stitched, kind of pulling the fabric under the needle a little faster than it would naturally go. It wants to push out in front of the hopper because of that biased edge, and I'm just not letting it. And that little bit of pressure with my left hand is all it takes to just keep it flowing smoothly under the needle. Again, I'm just adjusting my quilt to line up with my straight stitching line. And because there are a number of bias edges in this quilt, it's quite malleable. I can conform it to the shape I want it to be. Now comes the fun part. I generally use <clears throat> long clips. I'll show you one of them. Can you see them here? Yes. I generally use these very long clips on the side to put my side tension on, but they have extremely thin channels into which the backing fabric has to be fed. And I cannot get the minky in there. I tried this last night to see how it would work. And in fact, I can't get the minky in. So I'm going back to my original gamel clamps, which are just two lonely clamps. Not my preferred way of putting tension on the side, but it's what I have. Which camera are we on, hun? There we go. So you can see the clamps. And of course, what's not ideal about them, 
obviously is it's putting tension on two specific places, not evenly on the whole thing. So there, I basically have no tension on the straps. It's just the weight of the clamp and strap, just enough to hold this out smooth. Does that make sense? That's how I've got to do it today. Sometimes you just have to make decisions like that with the tools you have available. I'm sure there are other long clamps that open wider, but that's not what mine do, so. I'm way over on the left, so let me show you this. I've just got a yardstick that I'm putting across my rails underneath my clamp straps just to keep the thing lifted up. Again, that minky is heavy. It's wanting to sag. So that's just going to keep everything lifted up. So it's over at the left, and I'm going to need to do it on the right as well. So my two vintage yardsticks come in so handy. Um, inexpensive curtain rods work really well for this. Basically anything that's long and straight, long enough to lay across the rails. Okay, folks, we're ready to start quilting. Oh, one more thing before we start quilting. Magnets on the front. Um, have I got Lucy in the way? I do not. Here are my magnets, the long bar magnets. They're just the type from the hardware store. That's what I put on the front rail. So my top is floating. It's just hanging down the front. And these magnets on the front rail hold that front in position so it can't shift. So now my whole working area is secured on all four sides. And I am going to quilt crazy eights on this quilt. Now, as I mentioned, today is not so much about the quilting design. If you want to see more detail about this design, I have other episodes entitled Crazy Eights, where I talk a little more about the measurements and how I set it up. But today I'm just gonna quickly get my measuring tape on here and get going. I am just using painter's tape, really simple painter's tape to mark my guidelines. And that's just to keep my spacing consistent and my rows straight. Oh dear. Okay, that will never do. We'll just get rid of that one. You can't see it on camera, but we'll just throw that at Dave. I do want one intact tape because I use the same piece of tape for the entire quilt over and over again. I don't want to have to deal with one that keeps coming apart in the middle. I'll try and be a little gentler with my yank this time. Painter's tape, by the way, is one of my very favorite tools. It enables me to still quilt, quote unquote, freehand, but it gives me some guardrails. Make it long enough so it sticks to the batting because it does not stick to cotton very well. And loosen my clamp. I can just see that my clamp was pulling a little bit. I'm seeing that basting line of stitching, right? So that lets me know if there's kind of a scallop in it. I know my clamp's pulling just a wee bit too hard. Okay, I'm going to make an adjustment. I don't know if you guys could see that bump. I don't know that I can fix that. It's when my arm is passing under the leader. I think we're just gonna have to live with it for the first row. So I'm gonna take this first one pretty slowly because I'm getting that little thump with every pass across the top and I need to just maintain control of my machine over it. That's one of the things that happens when you're really trying to quilt close to the edge of your leaders. It's not ideal. But to me, it was, I was prepared to deal with that versus buying another length of minky and having a seam in the back.
And I'm just working my way back across the top, filling in what the pattern would look like if it was just repeating over and over again. I find if I don't do that, that top edge looks a little bit unfinished, but that is personal preference. I will do the same thing across the bottom too when I come to it. I'm not sure how good a look you're getting at my gray thread, but I'm curious what your take is on it, on my choice. Thread is a very individual decision, so if you prefer to pick the lightest color, that's the advice a lot of long armors give, pick the lightest color in the quilt. You go for it, you're in charge of your quilt for sure. But I do prefer having the mid-level that shows up on all the fabrics. There we go. And now we shall adjust our tape lower and row by row. We'll just start laying these eights on. And now then I've got a lot of vertical seams. Nope, sorry, these are horizontal seams side to side. And so I'm able to just measure at the left and then lay the tape down the same on the right. And I made it too long. I can see it already. You guys, you know Dave is getting the hang of this. When he saw that on camera and he was coming to say to me, are you sure that's where you want your tape to be? <laughs> half the distance, well, not half the distance. He, he's suggesting to me that it should be half the distance. It's not. And I could have made my top ones a wee bit taller than I did. I'm so much to fly by the seat of my pants, sir, that I don't always write down these measurements. And so sometimes I'm guessing quite frankly so yeah my top row could have been a little bit taller you can see these loops are a little bit more elongated but I do not think in the scheme of things anyone but you and I will know So I hope you can see how the gray thread on this navy, which is the darkest fabric in the quilt, it definitely shows up, but it doesn't disappear then when it crosses into the gray kind of background fabrics. It also shows up there. That's the look I'm going for. And my teal backing is the closest color I could find to these teal blocks here. Our daughter, who's the mom of this little baby, loves teal, so I thought that was an appropriate color to choose. This quilt has many colors in it, so I certainly had options. Now it's just a matter of rinse and repeat. So if you have any questions, chime them in. Otherwise, I'll move my tape and I think I'll get Mr. Producer to just put some pleasant music on. on. And I'm just gonna speed it up and start quilting.
and route a bobbin thread because I started with a partial bobbin. Look at me. I'm just going to, if you haven't seen me do this before, I don't choose to have a bobbin uh, counter on because they vary so widely and I don't like to waste the thread. So I just let my bobbins run out. And when that happens, of course, the last couple of inches have not had proper tension on them. So I always undo a little bit. And today I'm just going to undo till what I think is a decent place to camouflage the start. It's not super easy, sadly, with these eights. But I will do my best. And as always, I drop my seam ripper where the break is so I can find it easily. And I'm just going to run off screen. I've mentioned this before, I load my own bobbins. So this is how long it takes to get my loaded one off my winder, set up a new one and get it winding. Just like that. And I love to do that because I particularly like using the same threads top and bottoms for my style of quilting. Okay, we have a question about the bobbin. Northern Sioux, we never see you check your bobbin tension. Do you use a TOA gauge? That's, that's a conscience pricking question, Sue. I do have a TOA gauge and I use it quite often, but not every bobbin. I'm, um, one of my tension checks that I don't always talk about is to reach under, sorry about that folks. I don't know if that's showing across the broadcast, is it? Our one camera's not charging. Dave's gonna try and fix that, but I'll keep talking. I often will actually reach under the quilt with one hand and run my fingernail along it. And that's my simple tension check. Of course, I can see if the top tension is good, that's visible. And I can right away feel with my nail underneath if it's pulling too tight on the bottom. So that's my quickest and most often used tension check. And I'll be 100% honest because you asked, I don't check every time. However, I have quilted so much like I can see, and I don't know how to describe it. I do not very often have a bobbin problem, tension problem that carries on without me knowing. And all of a sudden a whole pass has come. I can see there's just something about the way the thread lays. So I hope that answers your question. I don't know if it was helpful. And I just locked stitched a few overlapping stitches over my previous row of stitching. And now I'll take a moment to clip those threads and I'll pan over it so you guys can see it's not very visible. Again, if you don't tell and I don't tell, nobody will know. Uh, where is it? There it is. Can you see it right there? Right there. So not too bad, I'm happy with that.
if you'll notice, I'm lock stitching my thread pretty securely at each end within that basting line so that I'm confident those stitches will never come undone. I'm just going to double check if I have enough room to do another row. Oh yes, plenty. Dave says there's a comment that I may need a little oil. I'm curious why you're saying that. Is that the sound of it? I think that's just the sound of my machine because I thoroughly oil my machine. I was in fact wiping up oil this morning before we started and that's normal to see a little coin sized bit of oil in the morning. Every brand of machine sounds different and even within that each machine sounds different. So for me this is Lucy 2.0 working today. This is my second machine and it's kind of a Cadillac compared to Lucy 1.0. So. <laughs> Not very bright, left my ruler right in the stitching row. And there we are. This time I will leave needle down because I'm going to advance from here. So while I advance, I didn't really tell you about my machine when I began. Her name is Lucy, you got that part. I sew on a Gamel 26 inch vision. So 26 inch means that's the depth of the throat from the front bar to the back bar, giving me a stitching area of about 23 inches or thereabouts. And I love having that large throat space because I do a lot of this edge to edge type quilting and it gives me lots of room to get a lot of quilting done in one pass. When I'm doing highly detailed quilting, I don't use that full throat space because it really is quilting at arm's length. So now remember my top is floating, so is my batting. So I always grasp my quilt with a little bit of excess in it and give the batting a bit of a tug because it tends to want to rumple under there. If that seems too bewildering to you, another option is just to literally flip your top up make sure the batting is really smooth. And I'm not thinking creases, but even just rumples pushing up under there, that will be cumulative and give you a problem when you get to the end. So make sure it's pulled down smooth. Likewise, the top. This is such a small quilt. I didn't do my measuring tape, which you sometimes see marking my left and right sides. I didn't fuss with that, but I am always visually checking that my seam lines are running straight. So every time I advance, if I need to, I'll make little adjustments here, smoothing it out to tighten it a bit or scooching it up a bit if I need to. And then the magnets go back on. Okay, we have a question or two, I understand. I'll get my cup in hand while we take them. And I am standing back from the quilt, just so you know. Diana, with Guild Longarm, we also have the short clamps. We attach long strip of fabric to the quilt back with pins and attach the clamps to that and move those with each advancement. That's actually a good tip. So did you follow that? Basically, it meant taking a strip of fabric and just pin, pin, pinning it and pulling on that piece of fabric so that it applies that pulling tension for the whole distance 
and then just move it each time. That's a, that's a great tip. I thought about sewing a whole long strip on there and I was just running out of time this morning. That would be an option too. Jan is asking what bobbin winder I have. I can't see it from here, Jana. It's not the Gamel one. It is an off-brand that I got um, on Amazon, and it works fine. I have wound hundreds and hundreds of bobbins on it. Forgive me, my little microphone is, and glasses are conflicting. There's too many things resting on my ears. The weight of the world is resting on my ears. Connie, how far down are you moving your tape each row? I'm doing it two and three quarter inches, but it might be different for you. It really depends on the size of the eights that you want, but for me, that's a good balance between uh, a pleasing look and not so small that it's taking forever. I find when I get them longer, it begins to look more in stripes. The loops tend to look more striped. They have to stay reasonably compact. Does that all make sense? Jenna, if my bobbin thread is off, it shows on my top thread. I rarely have to check my bobbin thread, but I do anyway. I'm kind of with you on that, Jenna. You know, if tension is giving you trouble, by all means, use the TOA gauge or run a little tension check on a scrap on the side every bobbin. But if, if you've got enough experience to know when it's not quite right, then you don't have to go through all those steps. Diana, what's the advantage to having the top floating versus winding it on the rollers? Uh, time efficiency, Diana. I quilt for customers. I quilt a lot of quilts. And so the difference between a 10 minute load and a 20 minute load is significant to me. So that's why. I don't find that I get a better result by rolling it on, so why take the time to do it? That's just my opinion. So now we're gonna base down our edges and I'm parked on the right, so I'm just gonna go ahead and go down that right hand side. <clears throat> And I know I've talked a lot about my channel lock, but again, my machine likes stitching in a straight line, so oftentimes I can get away without that channel lock and still get a nice straight line. But it's a check and balance if you, if you want that help to know that your line is perfectly straight. Make use of it. I am making sure my little clamps are catching a little bit of batting as well as backing. That helps just a little bit in um, keeping the tension even and not just pulling on that stretchy minky. I'm keeping an eye as I advance on my minky, like where it's on my roller on the bottom. I'm just keeping an eye on it is all I can say. And if I see things running amok, I address it right away and don't let it add up and get cumulative. And that's the thing, you can, in a big throat space like this, you can deal with a quarter or a half inch of offness really easily, as long as you don't let it go, you know, a half inch with one pass, plus a half inch in the next, plus a half inch in the next, then you've got a problem when you get to the end of your quilt. Does that make sense? So dealing with things right as they come up is the ticket. Here's a question of opinion for you guys. What shall I bind this quilt with? And I will say right off the bat, I don't have enough fabric of any of the prints that are in it. They were fat quarters, most of them. A couple of them were scraps. So that's really all there is to it. And this is not a large quilt. Um, the pattern I should mention is Bespoke Stars by Krista Moser. It's a pretty new pattern. And her pattern as written is a bit bigger than mine. It's, it's lap size. And I took off a row to get a pretty much square. I wanted a, you know, child toddler size. So mine's about 56 square.
I forgot to put my yardstick under the side here. Let me take a moment and do that because it's really sagging. So many little things to think of and when I'm talking to you guys I don't always remember them all. And a yardstick on this side as well. Another thing I just thought of that I'm going to show you, which doesn't specifically have to do with long arming, but might be of interest. Um, this quilt on the back, you can see that I've pressed the seams open. And that's what Krista recommended in her pattern because when you're working with angles crossing each other, they don't nest the same way that 90 degree angles do. And so it enabled me to match those corners well. And this is how it has to do with long arming. I thought ahead to the process of quilting it and I thought if I press those seams all you know to one side, these corners are going to be super bulky. So another advantage of having them open is that this one lays really nice and flat for edge to edge quilting. If you do custom quilting, you know how badly you do want a ditch when you're stitching in the ditch. But in this case, I did not need that for any reason. So I went ahead and pressed them open. I would love to hear your thoughts on the binding. You know, should I aim for teal like the backing? Should I aim for a mid gray? Should I take my fat quarters and chop them up and make a scrappy binding out of all these fabrics? That's a possibility. Left my ruler in the way again. You'd think I'd learn. Alrighty, Susan, put the ruler right out of the picture.
I want to mention a couple of brand new resources that I have available for freehand quilters and one is a recording of the edge to edge or all over feather webinar that I've done a few times and in the past I've just done that live but now I have kind of set it up as a little class in my school so that it's accessible at any time. So if you're interested in that, you can just pop over to my website, stitchedbysusan.com, and there's a little pop-up window that comes up right away that allows you to sign up for that. And basically, you become a little student in my school, and then you can access that course, that mini course, at any time. There's no charge for it. It's just a matter of signing in. And then the second thing is, uh, I'm losing my dates, not next week, but the following. So October 26, 27, 28, I'm going to be doing a three-day boot camp and it's kind of a I'm calling it freehand quilting demythified I'm looking at some of the reasons why freehand quilters get stumped or think they can't be freehand quilters and how to work through that and resolutions for that so that too is a free little boot camp and for that one you need to go to my Facebook page which is also stitched by Susan and there's a little more information on it there and a sign up page for that so I hope you will consider joining me. This gray fabric is the first one that the thread kind of disappears on. It's a good thing I'm on autopilot because I can't really see where to quilt when I'm on that. Definitely get one more row in. This time I have to measure a few times. I'm a long way from a stitching line to be eyeballing it. There we go. Okay.
see if we can do one more or not. Whoops, I guess I can't do it while my needle's inserted, can I? But the answer is yes, I can, because I can see my basting stitch on the edge, so I know exactly how far down I can go. One more row, and then we'll advance, and while, we, while I advance, we'll talk about binding. I'm looking forward to hearing your fresh, bright ideas. And by the way, for anyone watching the replay, and Mr. Producer will stop me if I tell this wrong, there is a setting on YouTube, if you're watching it as a replay, to be able to see the comments that were left during the class. So I don't think they automatically show up, but you're able to see all these discussions afterwards if you wish. There's a lot of apparatus to be undoing. Clamps, yardsticks, magnets. Oh my. Okay, do we have some comments about the binding choices? And here, by the way, is the end of the quilt. We don't have all that much more left. Okay, Northern Sue, love the idea of the scrappy binding. Minky, Minky probably not a good option for binding. Yeah, no, I agree with that. I don't think that Minky would, when you start getting multiple folds, that will be so, so bulky. Diana, I'd go with teal for binding. I like the teal idea. I, I don't have anything in my stash anyway that's quite the right shade, as you know. That could be tricky. Paula votes for scrappy. Joey, if you have the time, chop up your scraps for the binding, just the prints, not the background, in my opinion. I agree with you there. It would be just the prints. And I do have some of these I used every crumb, like this one, but for most of them I have, you know, at least those 20 inch long pieces from a fat quarter. Northern Sue, I like that. No background in the binding. I'm agreeing. It needs the color. Northern Sue, the figure eights look great on the Minky too, don't they? Okay, everything looks good on Minky, let's face it. But yeah, the figure eights do look good. Lorna Joy, wow, I'm afraid if I tried that, my wishbones would go slanted. There's tricks for that. There's tricks for that. Think of it kind of like handwriting and how you control the slant of that. Um, that can be really helpful. So we're basting the right hand side. I'm doing all the things which you can't necessarily see on camera. I'm looking down to see my roller that holds the backing. Is it still feeding on straight? Um, you know, I did not wind it forward with very much tension on it. It's just enough tension to keep it laying smooth. So the proof will be in the pudding when after we're done, I lay the quilt on the floor and trim up the, you know, trim off the edges and does it curl backwards on itself or not. 
that's when we'll know for sure if I've been successful. And Lorna, to you specifically about the, the shape of the figure eights and slants, um, I do have an intensive freehand quilting class that goes into a whole bunch of designs, including this one, in a lot of depth, from drawing them out to quilting them out to, to how I think through them, how I adjust them over time and why. Um, this type of edge to edge quilting to me is a bit like a science. Like I love delving into the anatomy of it and what makes each design work and what doesn't. So there's a lot more intricate detail in that. But for the purpose of these episodes, I try to keep them a little bit less about the quilting design and a little bit more about um, the big picture of long arm quilting. You know, the loading, the keeping square and straight, the dealing with different fabrics or different challenges, that type of thing. It would take much longer if I was instructing how to quilt each thing that I did. I hope that makes sense. So my gentle clamps this time will remember the yardstick. Yardstick at the other end. Magnets are on, we're golden. Sorry about the sniff, that was probably a foghorn on the microphone. I do find that it helps to get myself in a rhythm. Whatever my pace is, it helps to be really rhythmic about it. And you certainly don't need to start by going at the pace that I am. I have quilted this design on many, many quilts. And it's the pace I now feel comfortable with, but you do what works for you. Experiment a little bit. Because it is true that sometimes going a little faster makes things smoother. They smooth right out. And I'll say too, my figure eights are not perfect. I try to keep them consistent. That's the point of the blue tape. Right away, I've got consistent height on them. And consistency is what makes it look good in the end. I'm not particularly aiming for perfection. I want it to look like it was freehand quilted by a human.
while I think of it, something that I've learned through experience too is that it's not a good idea to trim up a minky backed quilt with your rotary cutter and mat. The little fibers are a menace and really, really difficult to clean out. So this is one quilt where I just use my basting as a guideline and I trim it with scissors. It's not as perfect, but if you lay it out on a pretty flat surface, it's not too bad, but it makes, to me, it's worth it to not have those minky fibers stuck in my mat. And my top thread broke. So that'll be perfectly honest is because I'm probably quilting at the top end of the speed at which my machine is happy. So I'll try and slow down a mite. When that happens, because it does create a jerk, you know, in the thread, I go back and re-thread the little intermittent tension wheel, which on my machine is just a couple of steps before the needle because almost inevitably it will have knocked the thread out of its proper places in there and you might not see it, but if you just start stitching again, you're apt to have trouble. And so I'm just taking a moment to re-thread the last little bit. Now that was only the top thread, the bottom thread did not break, so I have to go back and pull up that bottom thread and trim it where it left off stitching. I'm going to do a handy little splice there. So for starters, we'll pull up the bottom thread and trim it. And then the top thread is, you can kind of see where it was um, yanked and is torn. So I'm just going to undo a little bit there to get back to where I know the stitching is of good quality and tension. And often I use where the eights cross over for my splicing place, that to me is the least visible. And conveniently, it fell on the gray. What could be luckier than that? So I'm just overlapping about two stitches, putting in four or five little lock stitches right over top, and off I go. And then I'll come back and trim up that thread later. And it broke again, so now we have a problem. When it happens twice, something's wrong. Let's see. So I'm just going to work through my thread path a little bit, tugging on it to see if I see any resistance anywhere. I'm going to re-thread this area I just did. This is part of the process of long arming. When you have tension trouble or stitch formation trouble or thread breakage trouble, it is literally a matter of trial and error, I think, to figure out what it is. It's not always the same thing. So I just try one thing after another and it'll teach you patience, let me tell you. So hopefully it's not too brutal today while you guys are all watching. So I'm re-threading again. And every machine of course is a little bit different, but mechanically they're largely the same. They all have that intermittent tension, which is where you have the little spring that bobs a bit. Uh, I don't think they can see it. Can you see on? Oh, you can see on this side. On my machine, it's right here, but you, there's just a little spring here that the thread feeds through, and it bobs with every stitch, and that helps to keep the thread flowing smoothly because it's being unwound off a spool, 
and that's not particularly smooth necessarily. So that little intermittent spring helps with that. So it's important that you know the best way to thread that for your brand. In my machine, I go around at one and three quarters times, but that's not always the case. So now bear with me while I undo this bit that is sketchy and I can see it was skipping stitches here and there. So something was wrong all the way through that. Of course my bobbin thread is still attached, so we'll pop that and pull it out. So this is the live and unscripted bit. You get to see exactly what it looks like, but you know, problems are sometimes as helpful as things going smoothly because you get to see the process of trying to figure it out. So another thing I'm going to do is just check my bobbin. I'm just going to take it out and re-thread it in case it has, you know, had a jerk on it too. And in fact, I see that it's very low. I'm like down to lower than 10%. So I'm just going to go ahead and put my new bobbin on. because that can cause those sort of problems. A bobbin that isn't wound quite correctly or got a twist in it, it can be any number of little things and sometimes you don't ever know what it is. You just keep trying things until all of a sudden it's going again. And hopefully that comes sooner rather than later. So I've got a fresh bobbin loaded. I'm trying to get back over that minky. There we go. Scissors is hanging up, seam rippers put away. Okay, we'll go back to the same starting point. Not quite on not quite on the spot. I will try again until I hit right on that previous stitching. There we go. That's better. A few little lock stitches. Fingers crossed. The stitches look good. I'm looking really closely at them. They look smooth and nice. Whatever it was, I think we've nailed it. There we go. I'll just trim those thread tails. Sue, who had the idea of quilt with fall leaf colors, have you got it designed already? <laughs> oh, shucks. Apparently, Sue had to go raking. Too bad. Most of these fabrics, by the way, are Alice in Glass. Um, I have a couple times bought a bundle from her, and they sometimes include out of prints. She'll do a, I think she calls them a rainbow bundle. And there's just this variety of fabrics and I love her rich colors and because this is a boys quilt I love the fact that they're not florals. They're prints but not florals.
no idea if you guys can hear, but the our yard work is done by the sort of complex that we live in. And they've got the weed eater and the leaf blower going, oh, probably 12 feet away outside our windows today. So hopefully that's not too noisy. All right, while I advance this, I will remind you again of the new mini course that I have posted now. It's um, the All Over Feather. And to access that, it's super simple. You just head to my website and there's a little pop-up sign-up sheet. And if you have any friends who want to learn how to quilt the All Over Feather, everyone is welcome. It's totally free. You just become a little student in that class and then you can go back and watch it as many times as you want. There are practice sheets with it everything you need to make that all over feather doable. And then the other brand new thing that came out actually just yesterday is registration for my three day boot camp that's coming up. And it's focused on talking about reasons freehand quilters think they can't or want to be freehand quilters maybe think that they can't and, and how to debunk those myths and how to work through some of those problems. So sign up for that is from my Facebook page, Stitched by Susan. You'll see a post there about it with more information and a place to sign up. It too is free. You just have to register to get the links and the notifications and that sort of thing. So here we are at the bottom edge. And remember, you can't really see my hand, there we are, this bottom edge um, I think I got all these triangles set right side up. So actually I don't have very much bias. Only the little printed pieces are biased. So it's fairly smooth. I can see that just looking at it. So I do put my channel lock on for the bottom edge. It's just too hard to think about keeping the fabric smooth and straight and keeping it um, stitching in a straight line all at once. And I'm going to move it down just a hair. There we go. I'm just having a rough time here, ladies. There we go. I'm seeing a little bit of it wanting to pull ahead of me. So bear with me a second. I'm going to put in a few pins. This is always my mantra. It's easier to prevent an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. My mother had a saying for everything and that was one of them. So going ahead and dropping pins in just gives me checkpoints. So every five or six inches, I know if I'm keeping on track or if it's getting away from me. Pins are your friend. I know why it's feeling stiff. I've just had a Epiphany. My roller needs to go up a little bit. Got a chubby quilt roll going on back there. Oh, a little bit more. Sorry about that. I keep bobbing in and out of camera. Got it. Oh, much better. Of course, that adjusted where my line is a little bit, so I'm going to 
tuck it down just a bit more. And you know, I'm not sweating that my line is not, that there's a, a bit of a jog in my stitching because all of that is gonna get taken up in the binding. So that's not gonna show. It doesn't look beautiful, but it's not gonna show. See how my pins are helping? I'm able to see ahead whether I need to take up some excess or whether it's doing okay. And every time I come to a pin, that's my little check. Yep, still on track, still on track. And I've said before, and I'll own up to it again, I'm a bad girl and I stitch over my pins, but I do it slowly and I have never broken a pin or a needle doing it. I do it all the time. Don't tell anybody, okay. Now here, not sure if you can see on camera, there is a little bit of excess above my needle here. So I'm putting some tension with my thumb right in front. That's just pulling the fabric under the needle a wee bit faster then it would go on its own. And that's gonna take up that excess perfectly for me. See that, we've joined our stitching, it's perfectly flat. And I'll show you what that did. I'll pan over it. I hope it will be enough to be visible. There's just a little bit. Can you see there's just a little bit of fullness in here? We'll be able to camouflage that completely with quilting. But the, the trick is to do that gradually and evenly as opposed to pushing it all ahead of you and getting a pleat. That's where you run into problems. All right, let's get all our apparatus on. So I'm putting clips on the right hand side. And before I lay my yardstick in place, I'm just gonna quickly have a look at my rows. I'm going ahead a little under three inches per row and I've got 14. Yep, I should be able to get five more rows on quite neatly. And when I get to the last two or three, I'll adjust them just a smidge if I need to, to make them a little taller or shorter so that I end up with a row ending up right at the bottom of my quilt, if that makes sense. And it's not the end of the world if you don't. Um, you can do what I did at the top. It's just a little more fiddly to do um, partial figure eights that look like it's seamless but it is not the end of the world if that's what happens okay we need clamps on this side again getting my batting caught in the clamp too that just helps it not pull only on the minky yardstick tiny sip of coffee Yeah, let's do a comment or two before we get to the last couple rows. Tara, hi Susan. I've watched your replays first time catching alive. I'm so glad you made it today. Thanks for all the tips. I do use the blue tape along the line underneath on my minky to use a rotary cutter on it. Oh, that's a great tip. So what you're saying is you put the tape on the bottom of the minky against the mat and then when you cut all the fibers are stuck on the sticky tape. I would think you might want a wider tape than the one inch one I've got, but that's that's a great tip. Thank you so much for that. Lorna, I liked the all over feather class. I'm gonna try that on my next quilt. Good, excellent. Okay. So there are, if you wanna see the all over feather on a big quilt, I think I've done it twice in these live and unscripted episodes. So you can kind of see the quilt movement. And then the class is more about like how to form it. Yeah. I've gotten lots of good feedback about that and lots of people that have asked for it. So I finally just made it constantly available. So. If you aren't already, don't forget to like and subscribe. That's what gets these videos out in front of some more freehand quilters eyeballs. And it's my goal, I think you can tell, to be of help to those who are trying to learn freehanding. I love hearing your tips and I love sharing the ones that I've learned. So the more people that see these videos, the better.
So I'm going to take a look at my measurements here, see how I'm doing. Oh yeah, it's going to work good. I'm just going to shorten it up a little bit, less than a quarter of an inch. So that I can fit four more rows in comfortably. Did you see the figure eights on the minky? Let me back up so you can see them. Isn't that cool? And I will be sure to post photos in the next couple of days as well on my various social media spots. Don't forget to check out the latest podcast episodes. This past Wednesday was with Georgia Stull, who is a digital, computerized, long-arm quilter. Great lady. You'll enjoy her visit and her wisdom ever so much. And last week's episode was with Michelle Crawford, who's actually local to me. But she's been designing patterns in the quilting world since the 70s. Um, I can't remember the exact number, but she's designed over four thousand patterns in her career so she has some great stories about um, you know being in the business back in the day when you you know made long distance calls in the morning when the rates were cheap and you had to call the operator to find out who the PR person was and all that kind of stuff so she had a wealth of stories so that was last Wednesday's episode so you can check them out at podcast.stitchbysusan.com or whatever your favorite podcast app is. Oh, and it's called Measure Twice, Cut Once. Here is where I particularly measure when I'm doing a design that has a specific size. I don't want to do my next one say at three inches and the last one at two because that will really be visible. I want to kind of split the difference. And then it will not even be noticeable to the eye that they're a little bit smaller than the ones that have come before. On that very last one I was talking to you, I could have made it a tiny bit smaller too. 
but you'll see this will turn out just fine. Go up just a little higher. There we go. So just two more rows. Pull up the last of your questions if you have them or comments. And as always, please, 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 if you use these designs, tag me. Stitched by Susan. I would love to see what you're working on. These fabrics great. You've kind of gotten a bird's eye view of them as I'm quilting over them. I think all of the prints in this quilt are Alice in Glass. done with our tape. Huh, Dave made a catch. Again, I do, I always do that lock stitch really firmly on each end. I don't want this quilting to come undone. This is a quilt that's apt to be washed many times in its lifetime. And it's intended for that. So I just want to make sure those ends are really securely within my binding space so that they're not going to get trimmed off and well locked in. And you can see I'm not quite going to the bottom. That's just my personal preference. I like that whole eight to show. I don't want it to get chopped off in the binding. And so I'm purposely stopping just a little bit before the bottom edge. Now, much like we did at the top, I'm going to go to cross the bottom, adding in what I think those eights would look like. So a bit of the X is included. I'm trying to get a similar angle as I would have done if they were in an entire row. And that, I think, just finishes it off.
Another one, yes or no? Yes. Lock those stitches and we are finished. Okay, fire up those comments while I am unloading. happy with that. Have we got any comments? Just one? Oh, you guys are quiet. Lorna, what kind of thread are you using? Ah, very good question, Lorna. My personal favorite is Isacord and it's a 40 weight, 100% poly thread. Um, it was designed originally for machine embroidery. So like commercial, like caps and aprons and jackets and things like that. And so it's meant for high speed machines. It's strong. I love it. It has over 300 colors, so I love that about it too. It is a little bit glossy, so not every quilter loves it, but it's my go-to thread. 99.5% uh, of the thread I use is that ice cord. I do love it. Okay, that's it for minky backing. So I'll go ahead and stay on while I unload so you guys can kind of see it a little bit. And then of course I will post pictures for you too. I'm just gonna trim this big old chunk of batting off. I assume you all do this too. I cut, this is the big width of my batting, which is 120 inches. And I cut the narrowest part of my quilt this way, usually. And then I just trim off what's left. And often that will do a whole other baby quilt or sometimes lap quilt, depending. So it's more efficient than cutting the length of the quilt on the batting, if that makes sense. when I unload, I just get my leader right in place for loading the next one and clamp it. So when this one comes off, I'm already ready to start the next one. That, by the way, will be happening this afternoon. We don't waste time around here. Well, unless a good book comes across in front of me, then I'm pretty much sidetracked. It's worse than squirrel. It's like a deep dive. Okay, let's have the other comments. There are more. Diana, awesome quilt. Good. Well, you guys will love it when you see it. Um, I don't know that I'll have the binding done before I post pictures, but at least you'll get to see the whole thing and the texture. And you can see how my little leader that I put on, it's above the quilting. It's not even attached to the quilting. So when I trim this off, it will be totally gone. That's why I didn't have to worry about pressing that seam or anything like that. It didn't even matter. But here's the quilt. I'm so happy with it. See, thank you for another demonstration of a master quilter. Aw, thanks for the compliment. I'm so glad you all joined in. Once again, I'm Susan Smith. This is Stitched by Susan, and you're in my studio watching me quilt live streaming. So this happens the first Monday and, sorry, sorry, first and third Friday of every month. So we air at 9 a.m. Pacific time, first and third Friday of every month, doing a project similar to this. So you can always find the replays on my YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash Stitched by Susan. Thanks again for watching, and I'll catch you next time.